There is definitely something to be said for the amount of bass that a properly tuned microsub can deliver. And to push the edge of that envelope even further, today I'd like to introduce version 3 of the popular Hexibox based on the SU series 3 inch driver from Tangband. There is a new machine on the bench, several in fact, some nice new filament and a story to be told. So let's dive into some multi-chamber acoustic wizardry complete with a head-to-head -head in card demo. Lockmax is the brand you would see on the box had it not been for all this brown tape. Anyhow, this is their SC10 3D printer and I haven't as yet reviewed a filament based machine that took less time to assemble. As you can see here, it basically just ships in two pieces, so you attach the gantry to the base, connect a couple of harnesses, set the power supply to the correct voltage, tap it off with a spool holder and there it is. 235 by 235 millimeter heated build surface, 280 millimeters of travel on the Z axis, filament runout detection, 3.5 inch color touchscreen, silent stepper drivers for the X and the Y axis, meanwhile power supply, power loss recovery, it's all there. And now we'll put it to work, so let's talk about the project. Right away, it's based on the same 3 inch tank band driver as the original design, except now there's two of them. The enclosure itself, with a 230 by 230 mm footprint, makes nearly full use of the available print surface. Acoustically, it is a dual reflex design. The two drivers fire into the active chamber, which vents into a secondary or a passive chamber, which in turn vents out into the open. As per usual, the model makes use of the tongue and groove joint to achieve a reliable seal, and as a finishing touch I also designed a shield that goes over the front to help protect the drivers. Performance-wise, the enclosure should play down into the mid-30s, and while it can be used as a general purpose subwoofer, I also modeled it with special emphasis on compact space, as you'll see later. For now, let's crack into the filament. And here's 2 kilograms of the sky blue PLA from Novamaker. What's more, loading it is as easy as this. Though, before we get to printing, we still need to level the bed, and the large adjustment knobs make this a lot easier than the little ones I'm used to seeing. Finally, let's take a moment to talk about the software. Though the machine comes with its own slicer, you can also use the latest version of Cura, 4.6 as of this video, and there's already a Lotmax SC10 profile built in. So we'll go with a layer height of 0.2mm, 4 parameters all the way around, and a 20% gyroid infill which should take 2 days and 6 hours to print, consuming just over half a spool. Here, I'd also like to reiterate that while the physical size of the build plate is 250 by 250 millimeters, the operating range of the printer itself is 235 by 235. And as I quickly discovered, the latter isn't quite in the middle of the former. In fact, the forward extremity of that margin comes right up to the edge of the build plate overlapping the two front binder clips. So if your goal is to print something this large, you'll want to be strategic about the placement of those clips, unlike what you're currently seeing. Here, I should also point out that every attempt to print the model in this orientation resulted in the front left corner lifting and deforming as though it's been trying to recoil from the binder clip. What's more, by the time the print had finished, there were two major layer shifts along the y-axis, the cause of which isn't immediately apparent. The print bed carriage moves freely and there's good tension on the belt, so perhaps the nozzle crashed into an elevated feature along that front left corner. Removing the print was easy enough, though the included putty knife felt like it may scuff the build surface, so I used my Raptor blade instead. Here, Lotmax had gone with a flexible polyethylamide sheet that works kind of like spring steel and should be adequate for most prints. Bear in mind, of course, that when I design models for these project videos, I try to make use of the entire footprint. Initially, because it's more interesting, but also because it's a way to exploit the extremities. Case in point, a lot of what's happening here could have gone undiscovered had I simply printed a Benchy. Anyhow, back into the slicer now to rotate the model 180 degrees, positioning the rounded edge in the front left corner, thus giving the binder clip some much needed clearance. And if the first several layers are anything to go by, this may be a valid workaround. In any event, now's a good time to address the fact that the filament will run out before the print job is finished, and this gives us a chance to swap it mid-course. So, under the options menu, we'll select the filament swap, unload the current spool, confirm, load the new spool, return, and resume. The following morning the progress seems rather underwhelming. 
As you can see here, the build surface had curled, giving way for the model to warp along the two front corners. The outer shell delaminated along the side, and upon completion, a third corner appears to have lifted as well, leading me to question the efficacy of this build surface for larger models. At any rate, we still have two more pieces to print, so having re-leveled the bed, I set off to complete the remainder. And halfway into the second layer, the printer just stopped. An error 7 message appeared above the progress bar and both the pause and the stop buttons have become unresponsive. The supply documentation didn't reference any error messages, so I reset for another attempt, and luckily I was able to get my phone out in time to capture this happening again. Only this time the machine kept moving on the y-axis, bouncing back and forth between the point where it had abandoned the print and the physical limit of the carriage. It did eventually come to a halt, though once again the print menu wouldn't let me do anything. To their credit, the folks over at Lotmax were quick to offer assistance, narrowing the issue down to the format of the SD card possibly being something other than FAT32. And while the card that came with the printer was FAT32, I performed a clean format anyway just to be on the safe side. However, once I loaded the G code and reinserted the card, a new error code appeared, this time about a minute into the warmup, which, according to the temperature readout, didn't actually happen. Same with other SD cards, error 6, and no response from the buttons. Just then, it became apparent that I won't be able to present this machine in a positive light. However, this is also a project video, which means that we don't stop when a tool breaks down, we simply use a different tool. Especially as I've already documented my experience with the SC10 to the extent that its functionality allows. So, let's set that aside to focus on the enclosure. I suppose it would be in bad form to reveal what printer this was done on, so we'll come back to that in a separate video, but in the meantime, let's get some terminals wired in. Here I've more or less adopted these low-profile Helici brand binding posts as my go-to connectors, so if you plan to make any of my Hexibox projects, this is what they all use. What's more, I made these available in my Amazon store, hopefully making it easier for you to source the exact same accessories. And that includes these spade terminals, the soldering station, the speaker wire, and while we're at it... Why don't you let me fix you some of this new Mococo drink? All natural cocoa beans from the upper slopes of Mount Nicaragua, no artificial sweeteners. I've tasted other Cocos. This is the best. Right, so with that out of the way, it's time to let Sophie loose with the JB Weld. And once it has gotten a chance to set, I prepped the drivers with some blue tack, wired them up, dropped them in, and used some of these 30mm M3 screws to attach the shield. This is the finished product. We'll put it through its paces here in a second, though I'd also like to address all the requests for an in-car demo with the prior version, so we'll do a little side-by-side -side comparison. But first, let's get a quarter wave reading on the new enclosure. As you can see, the actual response curve is more or less in agreement with the predicted one, so let's move things out to the car and play some music. Here, we'll be using the AudioDynamics MK600.1 amplifier still hiding under the cargo cover from when I printed the 6th order series tune bandpass. It will obviously deliver far more power than is needed to get these little speakers going, though with the gain set below the threshold of mechanical clipping, they should be just fine. You'll be listening from the passenger seat through a pair of the Behringer C2 microphones and now cycle between the vehicle stereo without a subwoofer, followed by the single driver design, followed by the new dual driver design. Here we go.
And there you have it. I'll let you come to your own conclusions regarding the sound, needless to say these are not meant to serve as replacements for a conventional scale subwoofer, merely a proof of concept to illustrate the extent to which that function can be reproduced with something the size of a shoebox. As for the printer, I'd like to assume that my experience was somewhat uncommon. In fact, if you look around YouTube, others have shown this rig to perform on par with the CR20 from Creality. The one caveat being that none of the featured models ever challenged the machine along the footprint. Mine absolutely has, and as per usual, I made the STL files available on Thingiverse, so if you'd like to give it a shot, there it is. Now then, it occurs to me that I have two distinct groups of audience, namely the audio and the 3D printing hobbyists. So, as an exercise in broadened horizons, here's a call to action that I hope you participate in. First, comment down below with the name of at least one other audio or 3D printing channel that you think is worth checking out. Second, read back through the comments and give at least one of the recommended channels a shot. Third, if this exercise leads you to follow someone new, comment Hexabase sent me beneath their latest video, and I'll be looking into these myself. Finally, congratulations to the winner of the Tribit Quiet Plus headphone giveaway, more of these to come in the future. But in the meantime, don't forget to rate this video as you see fit, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. We'll do something bigger. Cheers!